His research from the Upper Delaware tried to understand the significance of this belief and what lay behind it. In this paper, I don't want to discuss the general, general, generalities of this belief in respect of ballads or songs, but rather to focus on a specific example where the insistence on the truth is not a simple statement of fact, but an acknowledgement that there is more to a song than the bare text reveals. Hidden truth. Stanley Robertson, whose dates are 1940 to 2009, was a settled gypsy, in brackets, traveller, who lived in Aberdeen and prior to retirement worked most of his life as a fish filleter, except for his final three years, when he led a heritage lottery funded project on the oral and cultural traditions of Scottish travellers based at the Elphinstone Institute in the University of Aberdeen. His knowledge of the traditions of his people was second to none and he is generally recognised as having been one of Scotland's finest storytellers and ballad singers. Among his forebears was Jeanie Robertson, his aunt, the legendary ballad singer brought to notice by Hamish Henderson. But it was from his great aunt Margaret Stewart, also known as Bunter's Maggie, that he learnt the following song. Here is his introduction. I think Green the Gang is true. When I was a bairn, when Maggie used to sing it, she said this was one of them taboo songs that we didn't sing in public because you can get lifted by the hornies police for it because it was like along with that other song you ken McCaffrey it was in that vein but I'm sure he belonged to some secret society to do with the Irish like the Molly Maguires or something and when it was sung it was almost like maybe like a communist song in its day and it wasn't classed as a song you would sing but I liked it I 
Ian, we're not seeing your slides. They're not changing. Oh, that is a problem. Did you see Stanley? Did you hear Stanley? We heard him. You heard him. Did you see him? Yeah. Can't tell you. <laughs> Mark, this is Mark. We, saw, we saw him in a tiny little image on slide three if we look to the side. Grief. You're, we're only seeing the opening, the opening slide yeah, with yeah. your first screen. Everybody else, the PowerPoint presentation can only be progressed by the host. I found that in other Zoom meetings. I thought you were making me a co-host, Martin. You are now. All right, we'll see if it works now. There was the first slide. Now it's advancing. There's right. the second slide. Did you see the, can you see that now, everyone? Yeah. Working now. Can you see Stanley? Yes. yes. I started for the rumble and go my evil way. So I became a Navi on request to me. Well, we'll leave Stanley there. You've, you've heard the whole song, I think. And uh, there you saw him singing the first verse again. The song, which was undoubtedly part of Stanley's family tradition, intrigued him. It's obviously Irish, Catholic, about a railway labourer's treatment by his supervisor and subsequent murder, and sung to a variation of a well-known Irish come all ye tune, but more significantly, it was a song that came with a health warning. Never sing this song or you'll get into serious trouble. Stanley was told. Unst understandably, he disregarded the warning, learnt the song anyway as a child of 12, and sang it subsequently, albeit infrequently. To Stanley, the sum of four shillings and four pence was not an insignificant amount of money, and he guessed astutely that it might be the equivalent of half of the Navy's weekly pay. As such, he considered the fine holy unjustified and not merely because of its size but because of the nature of the purported misdemeanor so he charged me four and fourpence for breaking nay a new wheelbarrow an old wheelbarrow however he does not accept that this on its own was sufficient reason or motive for pre premeditated murder which he preferred to ascribe to a series of undisclosed incidents indicative of what he described as the coarseness of authority it was this attitude and its bloody consequences that reminded him of that other troubled Irish song of revenge killing McCaffrey the song which had prompted him to sing green the ganger in the first place Perhaps more fundamental to the attraction to the song is the common cause Scottish travellers feel towards Irish navvies of the past. 
Kavideland recognized the power of such songs to create collective identity among groups alienated from power structures. Sullivan describes Irish navvies as the minority within the minority, the outsiders inside the outsiders. Such a description might be just as easily applied to the portrayal of Scottish travellers in the media today. Moreover, the vagrant status of the two groups must have indicated some measure of overlap, especially with regard to Irish travellers and travellers from the Highlands. Returning to the song, there is no specific reference in Stanley's version to the location of the crime. True, the murderer was brought up in Ireland and later apprehended in Cork, but there's no reference to which railway was being constructed or where the trial took place. Stanley presumed it had all happened in Ireland. Maggie Stewart's version, though different from Stanley's in several details, was similarly non-specific. A quick search on Google for Ganger Green led to the writings of Willie Maley about the Glasgow Railway mem murder of an Englishman, John Green, on the 10th of December 1840 at Cross Hill Cut near Bishoprigs. Maley has written a number of articles about the incident and with his brother John dramatised it in their play Gallow Glass the Glasgow Edinburgh Railway Murder of 1840. Maley's research had drawn on a series of reports in the Glasgow Herald and several broadsides housed in the National Library of Scotland, plus other accounts in local and national newspapers. John Urie's Reminiscences of 80 Years, that was published in 1908, gives an eyewitness account and in James E. Handley's 1970 classic monograph The Navi in Scotland there is also an extensive description. Handley notes that it was a classic example of trial by media. It gave newspapers the opportunity of feeding to their readers insinuation, execration and ghoulishness in an age when the fact that a matter was sub judice did not preclude comment. Curiously, amongst this plethora of documentation and commentary, no mention is made of a song, nor has a broadside text been traced of this particular song. In Maley's eyes, it was a classic instance of miscarriage of justice, demonstrating racist attitudes. There was no hard evidence, neither the murder weapon nor the bloodstained clothes were found, and the witnesses' statements were contradictory. Strangest of all, no defence was offered, despite the fact that Irish, the Irish navvies on the line had donated three pence each week of their pay to fund defence lawyers. Three Irish navvies were arrested um, and convicted, uh, tried and convicted of the murder. Dennis Doolin and Patrick Redding were hung and James Hickey, who testified against his fellow navvies, were transported. A crowd of 50,000 witnessed the public execution, which was held overlooking the site of the murder at Cross Hill. This was absolutely exceptional, and over 120,000 lined the route of the procession, with six or 700 infantry, 200 cavalry in attendance, plus troops, artillery and police in reserve. It was the biggest execution ever held in Scotland, bigger than even the execution of the body snatchers Burke and Hare in 1829. Below I compare the two versions of the song with the facts as reported in the media and detailed in the trial and uh, you need the handout for this. Hopefully you've had chance of sight of it. The persona of the song acknowledges his 
caring Catholic upbringing and subsequent waywardness. From the contemporary press we hear very little about Dennis Doolan's background save from which part of Ireland he came, Kings County, now largely Offaly. Though like his fellow workers he wore a teetotal medal and refused to drink alcohol after his capture or to eat meat, it being a Friday. We get a description of his physique and how he was dressed and one journalist from the Glasgow Herald indulged in a phrenological assessment noting that his skull exhibited considerable fullness in the region of destructiveness. Although the name of the ganger in the song Edward Green is incorrect whether this is the result of confusion, forgetfulness, the need to scan the line of verse or poetic license is not known. His extreme cruelty towards his men is clearly acknowledged and he is recognised as a bully. This is borne out in the press accounts which speculate about John Green's conduct towards his men. In fact, he had a previous track record and reputation for harshness, having been a railway ganger in his native Cheshire, where significantly Dennis Doolin had worked under him. Emphasising this image, the authors of Gallo Glass, the Maleys, have Green armed with a brace of pistols. The absence of a reference to Green's nationality in the song would seem to suggest that such information was taken for granted by performers and audiences and therefore not thought necessary to mention. The misdemeanour related in the song damaging an old wheelbarrow is easily identifiable as the type of incident that might lead to, to a dispute. For example, the Penrith Navy riots of 1846 were sparked off by a drunken English ganger. He was ordering an Irish navvy to use a shovel rather than a pick. Sounds like Sam pick up their musket. Wheelbarrows were the trademark of the navvy and they are often featured in contemporary portrayals. Ironically, in this age of industrialization and steam power, um, in the creation of, of cuttings, it was necessary for the wheelbarrow of a spoil to be steered up a run of planks by the navvy. And here we can see a contemporary photograph. The, the man who steered it was known as the tipper and he was assisted by a rope passing over a pulley and onto a horse gin, that's a machine uh, where operated by the horse to pull the barrow. The strength, skill, experience and fearlessness of the navvy being the most crucial factors in the success of the practice. Under such conditions, compounded by adverse weather, a wheelbarrow would, be quick, would quickly deteriorate and a faulty one would prove a liability. According to the press and the trial accounts, such a plausible ascription of the misdemeanour is not given, nor is it entirely clear what had happened. It seems that early in the morning, a small group of Irish navvies were congregated and recently, and the recently appointed ganger, Green, ordered them to get on with their work. One of the navvies, Dennis Doolan, objected to this remark, pointed out that they'd actually already started work before he arrived. Stanley's intimation that there had probably been a string of incidents leading up to this flashpoint was correct. A shower of stones had been directed at Green the evening before and there had been two previous unsolved murders of gangers committed on the line in the past few weeks. The sanction imposed by Ganger Green for breaking the barrow in the song is that 
the navvy has a large part of his wage docked. In actuality, green sacked Doolin on the spot. In Stanley's song, Green is shot with a pistol, whereas in Maggie's variant, Green is struck with a pistol and knocked to the floor. The accounts of the murder in the press describe how Green, together with three navvies, was stood on a temporary wooden bridge in the early hours of Thursday the 10th of December 1840. When he was struck by one of the navvies wielding an iron bar, assumed to be the missing poker from Doolan's lodging house. Maggie's variant comes closest to fitting the evidence. As regards the crime, one aspect in particular remains unresolved, and this is the question of a conspiracy theory. Stanley had speculated in his contextualisation of the murder that the Irish navvies might have been members of a secret self-help society like the Molly Maguires and drawn lots among their numbers to select Green's assassin. A similar hypothesis was part of the Glasgow Herald's comment on the Monday following the crime that the murder has been the result of a conspiracy organised according to the principles of Ribbonism is now beyond doubt. In fact, this particular accusation was never proven and no evidence concerning it was discovered or presented in court. Because of the pressure of time, I will omit the aftermath trial and execution and swiftly move from establishing the relationship between the ballad variants and the contemporary accounts to a consideration of the nature of the ballad, uh, of the ballad's truth to both performers and audience. When Herbert Halpert questioned the people of the Delaware in the 1930s why they thought a song was true, their answers fell into three main categories. Because they respected the integrity of their elders, all people never used to lie. They respected oral tradition, his second point. Their elders had had the experience, his third point. He saw it as an endorsement of hearsay evidence, provided it came from the right source. He also recognised the importance that singers attached to the character of a song. Such things happen, in quotes, or, in quotes, such things could happen. In this he recognised that singers were making a judgement about a song based on its moral feeling and aesthetic quality. In Stanley Robertson's respect for his great aunt, the source of his variant, and in his nurturing of the song and its backstory, not for performance but as an important part of his people's law, we can see that his judgments about songs relate closely to those singers whom Halpert interviewed. Truth in song is therefore a dynamic process that is reinterpreted and restated at every performance by each individual singer. The exact nature of the truth of Green the Ganger uh, was not the same for Stanley as it was for his great aunt. David Atkinson abstracts this process in postmodern terms. The authority of the ballad tradition, uh, the ballad tradition, traditional referentiality, the authority of the singer and the general condition of intertextuality permit an accretion of meanings during the continuous course of ballad transmission. Such accreted meanings nonetheless coexist with an innate condition of interdeterminacy, indeterminacy, which allows for the recreation of meaning at every encounter with a ballad. If we accept as seems most likely the ballad was written in the wake of the execution of Doolin and Reading when memories were fresh and its subject was topical and uh, the song would have 
in Kavideland and Porter's words corroborated veracity and helped to establish the credibility of the, a sequence events sequence of events that differed from the official version of the story moreover the truth of the song would have reflected and countered both the racist and sectarian hostility that existed in Scotland in all walks of life at that time even Lord Justice Clerk, who passed the sentence on the accused, did so with explicit mention of the inherent lawlessness of the Irish. However, his remarks seem relatively mild compared with the trial report in the Edinburgh Post. Here is a sampling of its vindictive language. Total disregard of human life. These men, if we may call them, so, are Irishmen, and we, we may add papists. The Irish peasantry are so mixed up with crimes that they are compelled to be silent. The lower Irish are sinking in an abyss of depravity. Swarms of Irish labourers who pour into this country bring with them a moral and social plague. These are not the truths that Stanley associated with the song, though he was well aware of its anti hegemonic message. To understand the nature of truth in this unusual ballad, it's worthwhile reflecting on Atkinson's condition of indeterminacy, which links directly with my opening remarks about the consequences of truth being out of control. Entwistle's chosen metaphor for truth in balladry is leaven, the agent of fermentation. In songs of disaffection, such as Green the Ganger, the potency of truth can be transformed, un can be, sorry, transformational, unpredictable and risky. Like the Irish Navvy, living dangerously the singer takes risks in performing the song and out of these risks emerge fresh insights hidden meanings and a reconnection of the audience with what paul thompson has termed symbolic truth and the values that underlie it and yet the hallmark of truth can also be steadying and comforting a guarantee of trust and authenticity and uh, here we have a painting of the railway <laughs> was I muted throughout thank you Ian um, a really fascinating explanation of uh, so many of the aspects of traditional song that uh, certainly excite us and interest us in uh, in great measure so thank you very much we have time for some questions and if anybody would like to ask anything of ian then you go to your participants box and there is a little icon that invites you to raise your hand. And Colin is the first. Uh, Colin, is that Colin Bargery? Yes, it is, yeah. Hello, Colin. Ian, it's very interesting. There's, I, uh, there's uh, a version of the song I got, I think, I can't remember exactly now. I think I got it from the uh, Inish Owen project. Uh, and that is called It Was In The Queen's County. And that has the song set in... Sorry, I can't hear what you're saying, Ian. I can't hear what Ian's saying. Unmuted, but I think Martin must have unmuted me at the same time as I unmuted, so it cancelled <laughs> each other out. What I was saying was that the, it's not the same song, Colin. It's the song the in, in, in the north of Ireland, in a show, and the song referred to is by Eddie Butcher. And um, uh, yes, the song I mean, in I... question deals with the, the same incident, yeah, and, yeah. but it gives a clear account of several of the facts. Right. It, it pins the story to Cross Hill near Glasgow and so on. 
It is a different song, a very interesting song, and in a longer account of this discussion, I reference that song in detail. Yeah, oh, you just said what I was going to say, Ian, that it's a, it's a more detailed song and presumably older because of its geographical accuracy. But to the same tune. Uh, yes, well, it's a generic tune, isn't it? It's a generic tune. It's a tune that um, that f serves many purposes, like the banks of Newfoundland, for example. And can people hear me? Yeah. yeah. There's a... We have another question from Leela Weinstein. Are you there, Leela? I'm here. Can you hear me? Hi. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question, and you may have covered this, and I apologize if you did, but um, so Stanley Robertson learned it originally from, um, from Maggie Stewart, um, but how did he end up with a different version of it? Do we know that? Yeah, that's, a, that's a super question. And um, we don't know the answers to these sort of questions. But what we do know is Stanley never wrote it down. So he recreated it as close as possible to what he thought his Aunt Maggie sang. He did actually use a tape recorder on several occasions to record his great aunt, which is why I have the version. And uh, he made several family recordings of songs and ballads of people, his father, Jeannie, his auntie, and so on. Okay. Um, Brian Peters, you have a question? Uh, no, then uh, Mar Marge Steiner, would you like to ask yours? See, am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, how widely disseminated was this ballad, either on broadside or um, in oral tradition? And in fact, how many distinct ballads were there on this subject? Uh, yes, well, thank you, Marge, for your question. The first thing we know is there are the only the two songs that uh, Colin referred to, the one Eddie Butcher's song from Ireland, and also I have recorded a version of Green the Ganger in Ireland as well, which um, I would love to talk about in great detail, but sadly the, there isn't really the time in this afternoon's presentation for it. But... Um, how widely distributed it was it? Not very widely at all among settled populations. How widely were distributed was it among Scottish travellers? Very widely. Many traveller families knew the ballad, for example, Duncan Williamson um, uh, and many others as well. Um, Stanley told me about a family where uh, he heard people sing it and the, in their family it was it definitely was a taboo song and you never sung it outside the family and when Stanley sang it and this member of this other traveller family heard Stanley sing it she was shocked she thought how could you possibly have learnt it we are, we're, we're the only people who know it but no not at all travellers all over Scotland had come across the ballad and many of them sang it and some may still do yeah. uh, thank you Brian Brian Peters you have a question? Yeah, I put my hand up and then put it down again because I wasn't sure how clever a question it was. But I was just wondering about this enormous military presence at the execution. Was this because they were expecting severe disorder on sectarian lines? Would, would there have been a, a huge amount of sympathy for the, for the accused uh, amongst the Catholic population? Um, Brian, this is not a stupid question. It's a very good question. And Brian, you ask any sort of questions and I'm very pleased to ask, answer them. Um, I think um, uh, there is a, a little bit of literature about this extraordinary event and the general consensus is that it was to show um, uh, uh, force to the, uh, the migratory Irish population that the British government meant business 
I think that's what it was all about. The, the notion that a couple of hundred of Irish navvies could actually cause some sort of insurrection is probably comical, really, when you think about the forces they were up against. So, um, apart from which they didn't want to, and on the act for the actual ex uh, day of the execution, they boycotted it in numbers. They didn't turn up, they stayed at home, they kept well away, um, they certainly didn't want trouble. And mainly in writing about, uh, uh, about um, uh, the... Um, I'm slipping for names now, but talking about Thomas Reddin and uh, about, um, uh, gosh, anyway, come to me in a second. He says quite clearly that, in fact, um, yeah, it was part of the conspiracy theory that was put about by the British government, by the British press, the Scottish press, the Scottish police, the Scottish army, that in fact Irish uh, migratory workers were bad news all round when it just plainly wasn't true and Scotland couldn't certainly not have functioned or developed industrially. Um, Scotland didn't uh, relied upon the spale pins to, to hawk their tatties and so on. The story goes on and on and on and the interdependence is great. Thank you, Ian. Very enjoyable. Den talk. Dennis Doolan and Thomas Reddin. Sorry, Pete. Uh, sorry, Brian. I forgot the names. Okay. And Ian, we have, I think we'll make it our last question from Conrad Blady. Are you there, Conrad? Conrad Blady, do you have a question? I'm here. Oh, hi. I'm here. I'd like to think of it as a ballad that proclaims the truth is really proclaiming the multidimensionality of meaning and that the people keep this meaning separate means that they are able to decode it through maybe what we might think of as frames of reference. If you have the right frames of reference, you can see into this poem this, the other meaning. Apart from that, almost every song and every interaction and ceremonies and whatnot, everybody attending, there's another belief or meaning in their minds. There's many meanings that there are people. But to organize this, they can be put into code. And it, it's, it's loose, and it's, it's, who knows what's going on. But it, there's something in that, I think, that you've got multiple, multiple meanings working at the same time. And the song keys into that. I hate to say virus, like those little projections on a virus. They are, if you connect with enough people's minds, the song has greater staying power, and it has, has more life, and has more meaning. And, and so the more it's connected. But to connect all often, you have to look behind the, the real facts and to the human nature of the interaction. Facts, are, they're there, but they're sort of, messed up a bit in a stew and you, if you like the carrots you go after the carrots if you like if you've ever had a carrot so you have a frame of reference if you don't have a frame of reference you don't see anything you can play as many lines as you want and nobody's going to see it because there's no meaning to it this is what we find so much in contemporary society where a folk song can be looked at by a group of or listened to or followed by a group of people and they can find no meaning in it because they haven't been building those frames of reference. Right, That's all. thank you. Perhaps Ian could uh, address some of those, those points. Thank you, Conrad, for the, for the point you've made. I, I agree with you absolutely wholeheartedly. And a very quick tale, Sean, I won't <laughs> spend too much, too long over it, but I mentioned McCaffrey a couple of times in the paper. Um, I sang McCaffrey in um, a conference in Belfast, uh, a conference of ethnomusicologists and they laughed. They thought it was a funny song. I sang it once in a pub in Aberdeen and um, I wasn't fully aware of what was happening but a fight broke out. Apparently someone had gone to take a swing at me while I was singing it and literally a brawl happened at my feet. Um, I carried on singing. What else could you do? Um, 
But the point was that when I later find out, found out that he'd been a member of the Black Watch and he, the 42nd Regiment, and he felt I was insulting his regiment, and uh, he felt uh, I needed to be shut up as quickly as possible. Um, so, yes, frames of referentiality are hugely important, and uh, uh, what to travellers may have huge meaning and huge relevance um, to ethnomusicologists might mean bugger all. <laughs> Well, on that note, Ian, thank you very much. Uh, a huge virtual round of applause. Um, superbly, as always, brought together so many strands to, to throw light on a, a fascinating person in the form of Stanley and uh, a fascinating song. So thank you. So we're going to move on, if that's all right, to our next section. We have a... Um, a very encouraging list of people who've volunteered to talk about um, a book that they have found in their researches to be really helpful and would like to share their thoughts with you. So I'm not going to witter on. I have my trusty oven timer with me, um, which is set for five minutes, but I'm fairly lenient. Um, first of all, we have Therese McIntyre, um, so, Therese, um, I will hand over to you if you're ready. Lovely. How are you all, folks, Hi. from a rather wet Galway today? Now we're, we're in the middle of a lot of rainstorms and all of this. Um, just to introduce myself shortly, I'm a song researcher based in Galway, and I primarily look at songs and ballads and social memory with a particular leaning toward uh, representations of historical figures in the song tradition and how people essentially remember these individuals through the song tradition. Um, the book I'm gonna talk about today is actually just a new publication and unfortunately I can't show it to you because the author only sent me a PDF, but it is called Sounding Descent by Stephen Miller. And Stephen is actually based, I believe, in the University of Cardiff. Um, but it really fills a gap in terms of looking at rebel songs in the Irish tradition. Um, the first several chapters give a fairly comprehensive overview of rebel songs leading from 1798 and even some of the early Irish language tradition songs of the Jacobite period in terms of looking at how they are used as uh, a form of cultural rebellion and how these are picked up. In other words, that people from 1803 picked up on the songs from 1798 and so on and so on, how they have a knock-on effect and that each political movement through history that comes along actually refers back to the songs of the previous period and there's reasons for that chain link of these songs. He also then looks at particularly with the Troubles um, and interviews a lot of people from the north, particularly in Belfast, people who were involved that would have been in Long Kesh, would have been on hunger strikes, but who also became part of the rebel ballad bands during that period of the 70s and um, a lot of it, the interviewees are anonymized because even today, as he points out in the book, it's not necessarily safe for them to talk about a lot of the things that went on at the time they were singing in these ballad bands. And it also discusses, he goes into a bit of detail in terms of how songs were used as a form of torture by, um, in this case, it would have been the Loyalist side or the British side where, where they were using the songs really at either high volume or forcing prisoners to sing things like the, um, the anthem and Loyalist songs and looked at that as a form of torture. So it's an area that hasn't really been covered a lot in terms of how rebel songs were used for and against a particular cohort of people. And then the last bit of the book, he actually looks at how these rebel songs are viewed in the North today and how they're actually looked on. Do they still have the same cultural currency that they had say in the 70s? Um, and, and it really fills the gap because I don't think this has been looked at a lot. I, I've looked at a lot of rebel songs myself and I think it actually opens up a whole area of research in terms of looking at how rebel songs are viewed in the South of Ireland in the Republic because it seems to me, excuse me, that they were used in two very different ways between the North and South. So I think it really is, it, it's a very interesting book, at least from my perspective, my own research, because it is an area that hasn't been looked at a lot. And I know the area Stephen's moving on to next is actually looking at loyalist songs and how, how they're used in the North in the past and also how they're used today. So I, I, it's 
I, like I say, I don't have a copy to show you. It's actually available, I think, on Book Depository at the moment. They already have a copy of it. But it's, it's well worth looking at if you're interested at all in the rebel song tradition in Ireland, particularly in the North, because the North has really kind of been ignored in terms of how those songs are used at the minute. Hi, am I on? Thank you. <laughs> yes, just checking that uh, you can hear me. Uh, thank you, Therese. Um, that sounds absolutely fascinating, and you are under time, so I'm very impressed. <laughs> That's great. Um, if you have questions, then please make a note of them or keep it in your mind, because hopefully we might have some time for questions when we get to the end. But we are going to move on to our next speaker, who is Brian, Brian Peters. If you would like to go ahead, please. Hello, everybody. Um, I tossed around a few ideas about books to speak about, one of which was the, uh, the wonderful co collections that um, Eftus put out a few years ago from Cecil Sharp's English and Appalachian work. But um, Lewis is already um, promoting Cecil today, so I'm going to go with this one. And this is traditional American folk songs from the Ann and Frank Warner collection. Um, a number of you will probably have come across Jeff Warner, who's, who's toured, who's a very active touring musician, both in the US and in England. Uh, he is the son of Ann and Frank Warner. And they were collecting during the late 30s and 1940s uh, in the Appalachian Mountains, also did some really good work up in um, upstate New York, right up in the northeast of the country, and on the outer banks of, of North Carolina, just off the off the uh, east coast there and, and I like this book because well first of all because I'm a singer and I, I wanted to pick a book that had songs in it I also wanted to pick a book that had interesting text in it which this does in abundance both in the words of the singers themselves and in the research that the Warners put into the background of the songs and I also wanted to put, pick a book with good pictures and this book is full of some of the most wonderful pictures which you may not be able to see but here is famous picture of Buna and Roby Hicks in uh, Watauga County, North Carolina, members of the, the famous Hicks ballad singing family. There's lots more um, wonderful pictures I could show you, but I don't have that clever facility that Ian had to share his screen with you, and I haven't actually prepared anything. But you have wonderful singers like Yankee John Galusha up there in the, in the Northeast. Um, he was a, a lumberman. He had great lumberman lumbering songs from the from the shanty camps he also had some really interesting and unusual irish songs and and some also very interesting civil war songs galusha was actually alive at the time of the civil war and his elder brother was fatally wounded a whole number of really rare songs such as the battle of bull run and um, which didn't really crop up very often anywhere else and some wonderful testimony from yankee john himself who who spoke about how in later life he'd been a fishing guide for a man who was an officer on the Confederate side and how all the while he was guiding him around the rivers, he, he wanted to kill this fella. But then he said, but he was a decent man, as many of those Southerners were. So we go through the, the work, the, the songs of Lena Bourne Fish, um, the, the wonderful version of uh, the outlandish night that she called The Castle by the Sea. Yankee John, who I mentioned, had a terrific version of The Flying Cloud. Um, Tink Tillett from the Outer Banks of, of North Carolina sang her Bright Smile Haunts Me Still, which has gained uh, great popularity in the revival. Also a wonderful version of Boney on the Isle of St. Helena. I just want to use up what, what it remains of my time by talking a little bit about Frank Prophet, who was one of the the singers that the, the Warners found in the, in the Appalachian Mountains in Watauga County. And I, I wanted to mention him partly because he had such a, a great store of songs. Here's, here's a photograph of Frank Prophet with his guitar. Um, he had everything from Old English, or Old Scottish ballads. He had a version of Bonnie George Campbell. And he had typical um, American um, made songs like like Groundhog and, and Reuben's Train. He was also, of course, the source for the famous song Tom Dooley that was made into uh, an enormous hit by the Kingston Trio. And what particularly interested me about him, and I'm um, desperately trying to find the page without success, but he, he sang a really interesting version of the ballad that, ch that us child fanatics know as uh, Young Hunting. 
in which um, the normal story is uh, that the young hunting or loving Henry, as he's often known in the American versions, is killed by his girlfriend in jealousy after he's rather tactlessly told her that he has another girlfriend in, other, in another county that he loves a lot better than her. And not surprisingly, she goes and, and stabs him with the, the penknife that she keeps handy for such occasions. But Frank Prophet had a most bizarre backstory. It, tie, it ties in so well with uh, everything Ian was saying about whether he believed the backstory was true or not, I'm not absolutely sure, but it was the tale that he said went with the song. And instead of the normal young hunting narrative, he had this truly bizarre tale in which the young woman, he said she was not a beauty. So in order to attract young men, she'd blocked off every path through the forest, except the one that she led, led to her castle. So that all the young men were attracted to the castle and then she would have sex with them and murder them. <laughs> And Frank Provid actually said, I, I know it seems rather tasteless to mention it, but she actually stabbed loving Henry before she made love with him. So it is on such, such bizarre details that, that my, I find this sort of thing so fascinating, both about folk singers in general and about this book in particular. How about that? Is that five minutes? Yes, indeed it is. Thank you very much, Brian. Gosh, yes, I'm, I'm worrying about the truth in folk song here. <laughs> but there we go. Uh, excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker has, uh, I hope she doesn't have to shout because she's an awful long way away. Uh, Felicity, Felicity Greenland, you're up next. Hi. Um, please, could I have co-host, Martin, because I've put together a few slides. Okay. It's on its way. Thank you. Um, while that's arriving, um, hello everybody. Um, I'm uh, in Japan at the moment where I um, teach English and use songs as a sort of cultural information for my students. And so for my research, I've been researching Japanese whaling songs, whale catching songs, and looking at them for information about um, historical Japanese attitudes towards whaling and um, the historical practices of whaling. So I'm very interested in being able to make international comparisons and um, loving the um, EFTAS song indexing project. And if only we could persuade um, other song collections, especially in here in Japan, to do similar indexing, um, we would be able to make international comparisons much more easily. Um, so I just wanted to share with you um, this book. Um, it's very much about Japan, but if I can just zoom in. Um, I think that it's um, an interesting model of a case study of a genre. And this genre itself is absolutely fascinating, I think, um, with lots of facets that can be compared and contrasted with forms of traditional song elsewhere, not least in the British Isles. And I hope I'll have time to pay, play you a little clip so you know what I'm talking about. Um, it's called Tears of Longing, um, Nostalgia and the Nation in Japanese Popular Song. And it's by Christine Yano, who is an ethnomusicologist at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. It's not a new book, but um, hopefully it's new to some of you. Um, and it's the cultural information in it um, is really interesting in terms of cultural imaginary and attitudes and practices, um, the roles of song in society and the popular consciousness. And she indexes some themes, which I have just pulled out on the, on the right. Um, and I think it's a very um, interesting book for you if you're interested in commonalities between different um, countries' songs and, and perhaps cross-referencing. I saw some copies available on Amazon for about £15. I don't necessarily advocate that you buy it, but if you can get it from the library, I think it might be well worth it. Um, it's about a genre called Enka, which is a sentimental ballad genre. And although it originates in the 19th century in political street song, um, it's actually, um, in terms of its um, mode, it's uh, the melodies and the themes are related to um, Japanese traditional folk songs. 
and it was very popular post-war. Yes. So it's favoured now by old people and considered old-fashioned by young people, but nevertheless very strong yeah. national sense of identity. Can you hear me? But they're, they've then. Uh, sorry, yes. Uh, carry on now, please, uh, Felicity. There was can a blip. Can you not hear me? We can, can now. Someone turn oh. their microphone on. Oh, okay. Well, you can read my slides. I'm basically telling you what's on slide. Um, so um, these are uh, three well-known anchor singers. Uh, this is the original political. Um, uh, he's not the first, but you know the most famous of the political songsters. And then um, uh, we have this Miss Aura Hibari, who I'll play for you. And um, lots of modern singers are coming up, but you can see that they dress very traditionally. And in this uh, book, Christine Yano talks about um, nostalgia um, and reminiscence themes and parted lovers. Does it ring any bells? Um, hardship and death and idealized memories of hometowns and so on. And there are lots of lessons and morals in the songs. Um, and it's, um, the, the singing style is traditional, but it's often um, accompanied now by orchestral um, background. And um, it's very theatrically exaggerated with some cross-gender um, costumes and things like that. Um, and uh, like the Andy Stewart Hogmanay party, it's always played um, out for New Year in Japan. So um, there, are, there are all kinds of different experiments going on with it. So if it, is it all right if I just play you a little clip of this genre? Absolutely. I hope the sound isn't funny. This is Miss Dora Hibari. I don't know if you could hear that very well, could you? It was uh, it was uh, tough, tough going, but we, we got a flavour, I think. <laughs> oh, sorry, okay. <laughs> well, so anyway, this um this book, I think if you could, if you if you are interested to read about um somebody's analysis of a different kind um of music, but some but one that enables you I think to make some uh, comparisons with like Enka, with Irish Danos and Music Hall and so on. Um, I think it could be in, of interest to anybody who wants to broaden their horizons a bit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felicity. That was fascinating and uh, certainly revealing uh, another genre that uh, I certainly knew nothing about. So thank you. Uh, and we're going to move on to Vic Smith. Um, who has special dispensation to be uh, a little little over five minutes, but not over six minutes, I seem to remember. <laughs> right, I can say that. Can you hear me? 
Yes, thank you, Vic. <laughs> okay. The book out is Bob Hopper's Songs and Southern Breezes. Right. Uh, this was published in 1973. Sorry, thank you. Yeah. Two years. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Vic. I'm, I'm sorry, Vic. I'm just I'm interrupting watching. you. Um, I'm afraid your sound quality is very poor, and yeah. we're not really understanding you. The vision as well. Uh, and and the vision too is. Am I am I close to the mic? I, I think maybe is it to do with the signal not not being strong enough. Um, uh, or would I come too far forward? One thought is Are if it's still breaking up. Yes, I'm afraid so. If you turn off the video, that might give you more bandwidth. With okay, let's try that. Stop the video. Right. Is the sound clearer now? Yes, it is. Yes. Let's, let's okay. go. Okay. Well, stop me if it's painful, okay? Mm-hmm. The book I want to talk about is Bob Copper's second book, uh, Songs of Southern Breezes. Second book, published in 1973, two years after its huge success called prize-winning A Song for Every Season. Heinemann wanted a quick follow-up, and Bob went for a book on his own song collecting in Sussex and Hampshire for the BBC archives. That was in the mid 1950s. The book also had a topic LP to a more a mentor and 21 songs in that. However, by the publication of Bob's second book, Bob's wife, Joan, was unwell and Bob became her hearer. This meant that he was going to commit himself to all the books, media, and literary events that Heinemann were hoping for uh, to support the book, and that was much lesser than it had been for the first book. This book only went to one edition. It was a great pity because Songs and Southern Breezes is in many ways a more song enthusiast than the first one. Not only does it have Bob's skilled and enthusiastic prose, but the word portrait of some of his informants to a well rounded description of some wonderful characters such as George Adams, Ned Adams, Turk Brown, and Enos White, and they really seem to bring them to life. It also tells us a great deal about Bob as a song collector. Bob didn't just collect songs, he collected like-minded people. Bob was a man of great social skills who seemed at ease with a wide range of settings. I got to know him pretty well in the decades from the 1960s onwards and worked with him on a number of wide variety of projects. I realised that Bob had a great gift for making people feel good about themselves. It's also timely to mention this book now again because through the efforts of Bob Law, John Dudley, it was republished in paperback uh, last year, first time for many years it's been in print. The book's not just about singers, one of the main characters, the singer, a remarkable man called Len Page. Some of you may remember the astonishing film, The Moon and the Skin uh, about 1971, a documentary about Len's extended family members. Talking to him was like being transported to a different age. Through Bob, I got to meet, to meet uh, two of the singers that Bob talked about in the book, uh, Leslie. Johnson and Gladys Stone, brother and sister. Now bear in mind, this was in the 1970s that I met them, 20 years after he had recorded from them, and they were still in touch. I think that's a mark of what Another reason for this book was uh, uh, because, I like it, because of a very small contribution that I made it possible. Bob, Martina and I, in the running of the Copper Songs Folk Club, and we used to try and arrive there early to have a chat with them. And one of the things, I asked them how this was going, the one he was writing. Ah, uh, a problem had arisen. Bob had no copies of the recordings he had made. 
and you want to be checked with what had been reported. So he took an appointment back of his in London, recorded on the 78 RPM records. He was stopped from doing this by a horrified member of staff. No recording was allowed. Well, but to stop, he had to delete all the recordings they'd made. Explanation that he had recorded and needed to refer to for the book he was writing, cut no ice, believe. Asked Bob if he knew all the catalog numbers for the records. Yes, he did. How would it be, I said, if I ordered all these records through the BBC Radio Sussex for my folk music sort of made comfortable of a very quiet. Another example of non-demanders was actually Bobby Copper. And I'm Everything sorry. always had to be above board with Bob. And he went very quiet for a while. Then he said, you could do that, couldn't you, Vic? But no one must ever know. I never told anyone after his death. He did tell me later that the recordings, listening to them, sparked other memories of the singers uh, and that had been a great help to him in writing it. When the book was published, a copy was given to Tina and I, and he'd written, you know you should be mentioned in the thanks, but you know or you can't be. So my recommendation is Bob Copper's Songs and Southern Breathing, available now from the Copper family website. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vic. And uh, yes, that's uh, reminded many of us why it's a, a good idea to have a, another look at that, that book. That's excellent. Thank you. And we have Marge. Marge, I know you're there. So would you like to uh, tell us about your choice? OK, I'm unmuted now, I think. You are. OK, great. Well, I am like wanting to recommend um, The Fellowship of Song by Jeanette Dunn, published in 1980. And it came, um, it was really part of a spate of doctoral di dissertations that came out of University of Leeds. Uh, but this was actually published as a book. And the book, um, as she says, is contextual and descriptive rather than textual and prescriptive. And she seeks to look at a small community through its song practice. Or, so the research was um, centered around two villages, Snape and um, Blacksall in, in, uh, in Suffolk. Um, and let's see. Um, so she looks at the sung song, as she puts it, the, the so, it's, it's not the song. The song is not a song without, it, it's, it's the sung song, otherwise you're just talking about um, academic hypotheses. So she begins by looking at, well, she does an introductory se section that uh, talks about uh, Lifeway's general introduction. Um, she spends a lot of time looking at singing in the pub because that's where a lot of the singing took place, Much, mostly a male tradition in the pubs, although women did sing, and there's a, a chapter on women. And the, it, and she talks a lot about performance because it, it doesn't really matter so much about the voice quality, the fact, it, the important thing is the performance itself. And a whole um, ethic or, of the pub sing, it was sing, say, or pay. So, um, and everybody um, was invited to participate in some fa fashion, but people rarely paid, as it were. And she spends a lot of time talking about an evening 
in this particular pub and uh, this the ship in in Blacksall. And you get to see the the various roles that singers and audience members perform. So for example, you had you had um um oh gosh, um the uh, the first singer um oh I'm having a brain um um the the guy that sang uh, uh, per, poacher um Cyril Poacher who begins the performance by singing the nutting girl um and he had a great ability to get people to to sing with him he had a uh, tremendous uh, musical ability but she said that when he wasn't singing he was not particularly a body kind of guy um so that the persona that he adopted, at least for this performance, um, as when he became a singer, um, that was not necessarily the per what the role that he assumed in other contexts. So, so you had so four singers basically took um, were were the key star um, stars in the in the pub sing. You also had. A, a guy that took the role of chairman. Uh, there was a man named Percy Ling who took the role of sort of protecting other singers. Um, and you also, it was also mentioned how disruptive some outsiders could be when, um, who did not understand the ethics, uh, American servicemen um, who played banjo and guitar and stuff. So, it it's just gives you a really nice um, feel for what is going on during um, the singing. One of the things that really intrigued me about the book was his talk about the young people and that basically there was a whole notion of age appropriateness. Um, so if you were very young as a kid, you might sing pop songs. If you were a little older, you might sing country western. And as an older person, you might sing uh, uh, traditional songs. So um, let me see. I wanted to find a quote here really quickly. So there was always a trope, and I don't know if she specifically says this, um, but you know, there's always the idea that, you know, we've got to get songs before they die out because along come media and they sort of eat up all the folklore. But what she said is, okay, newcomers to the adult world of the pub learned and performed current popular songs and as the old men died, the new generation performed the traditional songs which they had long heard and learned, but had sung only in uh, other pubs or not at all, um, and and this was so that you know you you wanted to res in terms of song ownership, you didn't want to threaten the older singers, so you would have a period again, younger people maybe they are latent tradition bear bearers, and then as they move up the age chain as it were um, and as old older people die they may become active because the whole time that they're in the pub they are listening and absor absorbing and observing so I thought that whole idea of the sort of age grading and the, that notion of appropriateness was really interesting um, aesthetics um, and this is as I experienced also um, folks didn't really have a clearly defined aesthetic that they could articulate. The performance was really the important thing, but it was also note, noted that you needed to have maybe not a tutored voice, but a tuneful voice. Since the emphasis was often on telling a story, your enunciation needed to be clear, your delivery needed to be able to um, sort of bring the um, sto story forward. 
So this book, I think, is wonderful in that it was one of the earlier books that emphasized um, practice, living, living performance, and the and the interconnectedness of singer and community and it influenced me a lot in doing my doctoral field work in Northern Ireland and so I would really strongly recommend this book. Again, The Fellowship of Song, Jeanette Dunn, published in 1980. So that's me. Thank you very much, Marge. That's, uh, that's excellent. Uh, and again, it's made me feel guilty that it's on Martin's bookshelves, but I haven't actually read it. So I oh, well, you should. I will. I will. <laughs> uh, John, John Baxter, uh, are you there? You're I am up. here. I oh. want to recommend this book. It's big and it's thick and it's about 800 pages long. It's by Mike, Michael Kilgariff and it's called Sing Us One of the Old Songs, A Guide to Popular Songs from 1860 to 1920. I was struck by what Brian Peters said, that he liked his book because it had interesting text, it had songs and it had pictures. This book has nothing like that at all. It has no songs, no pictures and very little interesting text. But what it does have is a list of 18,000 songs sung between 1860 and 1920. The people who sang them and the people who wrote them. And, that, and, and, and it's, it's almost, it's a book that shouldn't have been written in many ways. It was published in 1998, at a time when that sort of information could have been much better presented as, as, as a website, perhaps. But it wasn't. It was published as a book. And, and as far as I can see, if you're interested, like I am, in the intersection between mu folk music and music hall, it's, it's actually in an invaluable resource. It's, it's a starting point of the story. It doesn't tell you the story of a song. So if I give you an example of, of a song I was interested in, I was interested in a song called uh, The Birds are in, Birds in the Trees, The Birds Upon the Trees, sorry. I came across John Bowden singing it as part of this folk song, A Day Project. He said it's a musical song. It's by an American called W.C. Roby. Now I couldn't find out anything about, about the song until the book arrived it, 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 in the post. I found out it was sung by a fellow called J.W. Over, Rowley. Well, I found out his nickname was Over Rowley later on. Um, and that, that set me on a journey of finding out the story of J.W. Rowley, who was also famous for singing um, various other songs that have entered into the folk, into, into the, the folk tradition. But J.W. Rowley was, was, was someone that came from a working class background. He claimed his father was a taxidermist and had fought, in, had, had fought, um, had fought for, for Wellington. Uh, but that's not, uh, at Waterloo, but that's not necessarily true because he, he may have made that bit up. But, but he was known as Over Rowley because when he sang his songs, he would do one handed handstands mm -hmm. and the crowds would shout, Over Rowley! And over he would go in the middle of a, in the, in the middle of a song. I've never tried it myself singing, singing his, his, his songs, but it's quite a nice vision as, as, as you sing them. But the, but the only reason I know that he sang it is because of that entrance into, into, into this huge book of, of lists. And, and I'm, I'm sort of in this mad labor of Sisyphus, mad never ending uh, task of trying to analyze and look at musical songs that have entered into the folk tradition. And every, almost every one I look at, at some point, I have to refer to Kilgariff. So this, this fella has spent a lifetime collecting songs. Uh, uh, um, he's not trying to collect folk songs, and he's not giving you very much information about them, but he tells you who sang them, who published it, when, and, 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 who, and who wrote it. And that can be enough to set you off uh, to, find out an awful lot, to find out an awful lot more. And I couldn't be doing this project on Music Hall without, without the work, the work that's he, that he's done. So it's not an exciting book. It's not the first book you should buy about Music Hall if you're interested. There are other books you can buy. But if you want to find out anything about the songs that were sung in that 60-year period between 1860 and 1920, it's, it, it seems to me I can't find another book which does the same thing. The end. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, that's great. And uh, we've, we've clawed back a little time. I will um, just say something about the time now. We're at 1726 over here. Um, so with a, a warning, I think we've decided we will go over time a bit. I know some of you might have to leave. Um, 
before I forget, could everybody who's presented a book review on this, this forum, could they email it to Martin so we're able to let everybody know exactly the title and the author? That would be really helpful. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take three more book uh, recommendations. So apologies to Bruce, Keith, and sorry, Martin. Um, we're going to hear from next Margaret Bennett, then Lewis Jones, and then John Molden, and then we really will come to an end there. So, Margaret, uh, would you like to take over? Thank you, Shan, and thanks to all the speakers and reviewers. It's, it's a wonderful program. This I'm really enjoying myself. I didn't choose my book for today because I was researching something. I chose it really out of affection for the person whose book it is and also for the person who did the research. Um, the book is Up Yon Wide and Lonely Glen. It's Elizabeth Stewart's Songs and Life Stories. The subtitle is Traveller Songs, Stories and Tunes of the Fetter Angus Stewarts. And although it's entirely from the point of view and the story and the songs of a traveling family, yet um, you will soon discover that the songs really are, are songs of much a wider area than that. And for me, because I remember the travelers coming around, my family are stewards from Skye, they would be brought into the house and there was very little boundary between the conversations. They felt very much at ease sharing the songs and the stories. And that is more than comes across in Elizabeth's book. It's a book that Alison says took 15 years to write, and you can certainly understand that. Actually, looking around the, the, the room here, if I can call it a room, there's, it connects with several people here. Many of you knew her. Some of you recorded her and have written about her. Yes, and are holding up the book. And um, the, the CDs produced anyhow. Not enough time to talk about all those. So to the book, it's based on tape-recorded interviews. Um, she was first recorded by... Hamish Henderson, and in fact, Alison wrote a, a lovely article in a, one of the collections of essays on Hamish's life, paying him tribute for really getting us all interested. And she also mentions the fact that Kenny Goldstein, who was an, a Fulbright scholar in 1959 and 60, recorded widely among the Fetter Angus Stewarts while he was based at the School of Scottish Studies. And Kenny himself thanks Hamish for sending him in that direction. And out of that project came his 12-inch his album of Lucy Stewart's songs. Lucy was Elizabeth's aunt, and Lucy was born in 1901. Her aunt taught her probably more songs than her mother did. The whole story is so pieced together, you feel really you've been sitting by the fireside for days. And I think there's something special about this. It's... It's one woman to another telling this story. It's heart to heart, it's eye to eye, and you can really hear Elizabeth speaking on the page. She talks about her grandmother who died actually when she was three, but she can remember, but she obviously has heard about her. All Betty, she calls her, and she had many sad tales as she traveled about. And even as she went round the doors and fed her angus, folk trusted her, and she was told many a sad tale. This is the story behind one of the ballads, Cruel Edwin, which is based on one tale that all Betty was told. One day she was visiting a woman and she knew her, oh, she thought she knew her. And she says, um, oh, she says, Betty, I feel an awful low the day. What's wrong, said my gran. Well, you see, a long, long time ago, a terrible thing happened. Oh, my God, says all Betty. How was that? If you come inside, I'll tell you. You know, I can trust you, she said. And my granny went in and she tailed her and on it goes. And you feel that you're there, you get the song, you get the story and it moves on. And we meet Elizabeth's mother, Jean Stewart, who, if she were telling you this, she was a famous dance band player, composer, broadcaster. People who didn't know the travellers very well might say from a travelling family, how could that be so? But in fact, she was a highly literate and educated musician. She even had, yes, whoops, can I get this on my page, diplomas from the London College of Music. She was the most incredible pianist and, and player, and she's 
was often recorded she has BBC contracts here and so on and they go right back to what's the date? Oh, the 30s. So Elizabeth grew into this family but because her mother was playing so often she often spent time with Lucy and it was there that she learned a lot of her songs. And the, the book is it's quite a long book, it's over 400 pages and actually for me the typeface is just a little small, perhaps that's my age. But it's packed, it really is, in four chapters, divisions of her life, and each chapter has maybe 20, 30 songs. In all, there are nearly 150 pieces, and it's still not her complete repertoire, but we get the stories behind those songs. It's, we get the ones we hope we'll find, like Benori or Her Law, and you hear her Her Law, or her version is different to other versions, but you hear why she learned it and how and what it meant to her. You really get the sense that, yes, they had the historical, certain historical facts about when the battle was and who fought, but it's the emotional truth of these songs that truly, truly comes across. And it certainly shows in Elizabeth's singing. You begin to understand why she had that passion in her voice that was so full of conviction. Why would I want to have the book? Well, I would want to have maybe more than one copy. I normally don't lend books unless I can say people, you can read them in my house, but it would be one I would either encourage my students to buy or lend or read. And in fact, I would say for all of you, it's that inside story of her life and of her songs and what they meant. Singing, it was like breathing. It was the air we breathe. And it's the sort of thing that really kept her it kept her going and Elizabeth sang on both sides of the Atlantic she was really quite well known and yet you always felt there was more to find out about her other songs that um, you might know of hers Sailing Sailing or the Helen Man's Ball she had quite a sense of humor or quite a wicked sense of humor actually and that definitely comes across she did not her, some of the stories are not for the delicate ears but it's just so absolutely candid sometimes it's painfully honest reminds me just a little bit of Peggy Seeger's biography in as she opens up and tells you things she doesn't have to tell you that but we know that her mother as she said, got an awful battering from her father. He was an awful, horrible man. Not the sort of things you want to tell at the folk club, but it does, in some ways, in, it's part of her. It's who she is, and she, it's, it's who she determined that it would not happen in her lifetime. She um, has a huge repertoire, and we get a whole range of it. She remembers, for example, when Ewan McCall arrived and they were working on the radio ballads of 1960 and they went to visit her Aunt Lucy and Aunt Lucy said, you play him that tune and she did and from then he wrote um, Come All Ye Fisher Lassies she sang that and other songs on that programme with her sister Jean and she says, oh we had a great time in Birmingham Charles Parker, Bert Lloyd and Peggy and Ewan oh it was all really nice to us, oh my it was hard work we had to rehearse quite a bit because the recordings were made with a live orchestra playing by the back of us. Now I'd been playing a lot of years and I could improvise on a piano and harmonize with my sister, but this was a musical director, this was very different. And it was Peggy and she taught me that I didn't need to harmonize every word and she goes on to describe what she learned from Peggy. And yet if you heard Elizabeth herself play, there may be few musicians or singers who could be so versatile jazz, blues, um, ragtime, classical music. She could play literally anything. When she heard Winfred Atwell, all of us here, are most of us will remember Winifred Atwell and her amazing hands. Elizabeth could play that, the black and white rag, absolutely off pat. And then she'd go into a, a, an ancient ballad. The versatility is absolutely astounding and the naturalist with which she portrays it. Um, and I laughed, uh, well, I've laughed several times through this, but I hope this doesn't sound a little irreverent if I choose this little bit to read when she first met Bert Lloyd. I, I think actually, Margaret, I'm so sorry to interrupt you because we do love hearing. Well, but that's great. I, I apologise. Read the book. Please. And maybe it's just as well I didn't read that bit. Read it for yourself. <laughs> exactly. Elizabeth's book. 
Up your Thank wild you. and lonely glen. Thank and you. I love that book. <laughs> I do, you. and thanks um, to thanks to Alison as well for writing it. Thank absolutely. you. We're going to wing over to Lewis now, who I'm pretty sure Lewis Jones. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Okay, uh, hang on. Um, uh... Yeah, gone muzzy again. Mm. Oh. Hang on, it's not working. Hang on. Slide show from the beginning. Right. Well, you got that, folks? Mm -hmm. That's good. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, this is, um, uh, this is 100 English Folk Songs, 1916, by, by Cecil Sharp. Um, you can buy this book if you want to. There's the copy I bought, the front cover. Uh, the uh, the Dover edition of 1979. Um, you can also download it from at least two places. It's freely available on the Internet Archive. Uh, don't bother with the uh, with, with the, the long uh, email address. You can find it easily enough by searching. And also um, from the International Music Score Library Project, IMSLP, which is a great source for many um, folk song books that are out of uh, out of print. If you want uh, if you want PDFs. PDF images of them. Um, the, uh, if you do download it from the Internet Archive, uh, this is one of the copies that you get. Uh, that's the, uh, that's the, uh, the title page, uh, 100 English Folk Songs by Cecil Sharp, The Medium Voice. Um, the song titles, um, uh, this is worth pausing over briefly. There's a, there's, Loads and loads of, of iconic uh, folk, folk songs uh, in the uh, uh, in, in the hundred songs. Uh, Searching for Lambs was mentioned. I think at our last meeting as the the archetypal classic folk song. As I wrote that one one May morning, that's there. Um, Seeds of Love is there. The first uh, song that Cecil Sharp collected down there in Somerset in the early 1900s. The classic ballads. You can see them on the screen there. Ballads like High Barbary, Bruton Town, Death of the La Death and the Lady. Uh, and the songs, uh, you can't see all of them because this is just the first page of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the contents. But uh, you've got Farewell, Nancy, Crystal Spring, The Cuckoo, 17 Come Sunday, Spanish Ladies, uh, John Barleycorn, uh, loads of, um, of, of iconic folk songs that sort of thing you, if like me, you were lucky and you had a good music teacher, you learned some of them at school. Um, uh, there's, a, there's an introduction by Cecil Sharp. Uh, uh, what, uh, uh, the, the bit of this, this I like is down here. I don't know if you can see my. Uh, well, he, he, it's, it's not very fashionable now, this, but I agree with what he says. He describes folk song as a great peasant art. Um, and then he goes on to discuss things like the, um, uh, the, uh, the scales these songs have come down to us in and so on and so forth. Um, the, um, the notes, um, <clears throat> uh, again, are, are quite, quite long. This is, this is the first page of the notes. Um, Henry Martin's got quite a long, the first, book, first song in the, uh, in the collection's got a fairly long um, uh, uh, note there because there's quite a lot to say about that, um, uh, uh, that, that, that Scottish pilot. And uh, then Bruton Town and so on, so it goes forth. So that's the book itself. I also wanted today to, um, to acquaint you with um, some resources that support the book. Um, that on, uh, on, our, um, uh, on our wiki on Folkopedia, and uh, again, don't bother worrying about the long address, you can find it easily enough if you go to Folkopedia and look. The resources that are there to support it, um, uh, if you look at, if you turn to the page, that, that's the page there, and then what you do, um, uh, there's the 100, the 100 books, um, you, uh, you click on whichever one you're interested in. Now let's imagine, for example, that we click on the Raggle Taggle Gypsies, number five there. Um, this is what you get then. You get this uh, uh, this uh, web page. Uh, uh, you, you've got a tune analysis attempted by me there. Um, I reckon it's authentic heptatonic and diaolian for those of you who are into music. And uh, on that one, Cecil Sharp agrees with me. But if you don't agree, you can go on to Folkopedia and change that because it's a people resource. Um, it's uh, it's open to uh, to amendment and improvement by us all. Um, the sheet music from 1916. Again, you get you, this is just if you if you want to just download the sheet music for that particular song. Uh, there's the first page of the sheet music. 
they work for the gypsies, come to my door, etc. Um, you can download that. Um, uh, you, can, you can see Cecil Sharp's note of 1916 there again. Um, uh, he's quite knowledgeable, I would find, Cecil. Um, uh, he knows quite a lot about the, uh, the, um, the previous uh, instances of the song. And then he's, he's, he's told you that he's noted 18 variants of a uh, raggle taggle gypsy and he's given some of the, some of the, um, the, printed, uh, the printed sources there as well. Um, uh, and uh, then uh, the MIDI file. Now, this is for the benefit, in particular, of people who perhaps aren't too good at reading music. Um, but if, if, if you don't worry if you're not, um, some of our finest folk song scholars can hardly read music, if at all. So you're in good company. Um, but uh, this should, I hope, play now. Hang on. Three gypsies that come to me door, and downstairs right, it's a lady o. Oh. The one song high and another song low, and the other song funny and the fist and oh. So if you got that, it wasn't really loud with me, but I hope you got some of this. Um, and um, then the notation of the melody line, just the melody line, a strict of the uh, accompaniment. Uh, there's the um, uh, there's the uh, the melody line. Uh, in four four time there there were three gypsies that come to the door and so on um so um and finally um uh, if you if you if you want to download the um uh, uh the xml which you can then load into your music software if for example you want to perform a song and you want to add your own chords or alter um uh, what uh, what's what, what, what's in the original you can download the xml file and load it into uh, any standard um uh, uh um, music processing package and uh, that's about it, folks. Uh, Cecil Sharp, 1960, 100 English folk songs. In my view, the finest collection of English folk songs ever published. Um, I'm Lewis Jones, Lewis William Jones, uh, L Lewis W. Jones at yardwood.co.uk if you want to email me. And that's the end. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Lewis. That was uh, beautifully presented, nice, nice and clear. We know what we what we get when we delve into that. Brilliant. Thanks. Um, so we're going to our last uh, contributor, um, who is John Molden. I apologise to Bruce Lindsay, Keith Gregson, and to Martin. We'll hopefully hear from you in the future. But John, are you ready to go? Do we have John Molden? He needs to unmute uh, himself. John, if you I'm unmuted you now. Excellent, you're here. And I need to share my screen, so will you please give me permission? I can't yet share screen because the other participant is sharing. Hang on, hang on, sorry. What do I do then? Unshare. I'm unsure if I can find it. Hang on. You are screen sharing. Yeah. Uh, new, new share. Is that got it? No, I'm still seeing you. Uh, I'm sorry. Can, can you do it your end, Martin? Apparently not. Oh, God. Um, okay. Um, well, hang on. Stop share. Hang on, got it. Yeah. Okay. Right now we're back. Okay. Um. Sorry, I haven't got to you yet. I was doing that. Where are you? Are you done? No, he hasn't. Hold on, John. Where have you gone? Got to find you on the list. That's it. There you are. Okay. You can go. Does that should be able to do it now? Okay, let me go to okay. Right. Um a book which isn't about songs at all. And in this I stand out a little bit like a sore thumb, but this is a familiar position for me because I take to some extent a maverick view. And in this I have quite considerable sympathy for, for C.S. Lewis, because he too was, in this particular book, taking a very, very unusual stance. Usually, we know him for the Narnian stories, for his Christian works, 
such as the screw tape letters or a grief observed, and at the right hand side of the screen, I'm not sure that you can see it, his, the third of his science fiction books, That Hideous Strength, which touches on the Arthurian legends, but also has a Christian allegorical meaning. And of course, Lewis is best known as a very heavyweight English language, English literature commentator, professor at Cambridge, and a specialist in the 16th century, and on Renaissance literature in England. At the time when I first came across the book, which I'm going to speak about, An Experiment in Criticism, around 1964, I was more interested in these Arthurian things and in the, in the fairy tale aspect of the Narnian stories. And I picked the book up in either a bookshop or a library and was almost immediately taken by its applicability to traditional song. The Maverick is C.S. Lewis, an experiment in criticism. And it proposes that instead of judging the book by the quality of its writing, by the conventional methods, which is of course subject very much as Lewis pointed out to fashion, books go out of fashion, but do they go out of quality? So that the quality of books should be measured not by how they are written, but by how they are read. In other words, it is the reader who determines the quality of the book, not necessarily the writer. This is a, a dialogue, if you like. But it struck me that this was essentially subjective, that if this is what I like, then what is to be measured is the quality of my attachment to the book. And this struck me again, as this was how, at the time anyway, I would have chosen songs to sing. Songs are first liked, then learned, then sung. But liking implies that the song has a degree of quality and learning entails a degree of effort. Singing involves a constant examination and re-examination of the song. If the song can sustain this, keep on singing it. If it can't, give over. But my continuing to like any song or songs in general is enough to prove quality. It validates itself in other words. So if I go on singing a song, even if I'm the only person who sings it and likes it, that still in a minority of one still demonstrates that it has some kind of quality. So that for me, Lewis's uh, autobiography was called Surprised by Joy. And one of the things that does for me, as far as songs are concerned, is they surprise me. So that there are three things I think to do with a song. If you love it, you sing it. If you love it and you want other people to sing it, give it away. And the third thing to do is both of those. If the recipient spoils it, it doesn't make me any less. If it returns to me enhanced, I will be the richer. And as I say, I'm summarizing that. And I've said this in an article which is on Mustrad. It may not be visible, Enthusiasm 03, but it undertakes or it underlines the extent to which I feel that this particular book of criticism by a leading English literature critic underpins the way in which we can justify our own song, own singing of the songs that we love and the song in particular that we love. So C.S. Lewis, an experiment in criticism, and it's further expounded, as I say, on this article in Mustrad, and thank you. Thank you very much, John. That was fascinating. Um, really, a, a, a lovely angle uh, to, to shed light on, uh, on what we do. So that's brilliant. Thank you very much.
Thank you. So we're about ready to, to wrap up. Um, a reminder, please, to people who presented book recommendations to, to send Martin the details. Some of it's on chat already. <laughs> Some of it's on chat already, apparently. So that's, that's great. Thank you very much. Uh, and we'll hope to see you in two weeks' time. We already have, in fact, I think there are several different meetings that are already organised. But uh, next time we have Mossy Christian. Uh, who's going to talk about Alan Wardill and the musical Sherlock Holmes, uh, Ridian Griffiths on Welsh tune mutations, and then Therese, who we've heard from today, No Maid in History's Pages. So um, thank you for, for coming and meeting up with us. Martin may have something to add. I don't know. No, he says he hasn't got anything to add. Um, we're always pleased to hear comments about the meeting. Um, you know, we'd, we'd like to improve where we can. And if you've enjoyed it, then obviously that's especially lovely to hear. Uh, thank you very much. Lovely to see you all. And I think we're about to disappear. <laughs>